on World News Tonight. Power struggle. Ukrainians fear for the worst with the latest barrage of Russian missiles taking a critical hit on energy infrastructure. Energy emergency. The EU faces another obstacle in proceeding with a gas cap. Will there be any contingency plans? Find out tonight. Covid clashes. The country with the strictest lockdown policy sees a mass uprising in retaliation of infection control. And celebrations galore. A star-studded Thanksgiving parade by Macy's Lights Up Manhattan. This is Other There No World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we start off with the updates on the Ukraine-Russia conflict. The race is on to restore power in much of Ukraine as Russia's bombardment has left many cities mostly in the dark. Residents are now without the basic necessities, including clean water. When a Russian missile struck this Kyiv neighborhood on Wednesday, Nina Vlasiak says she was at home with her 10-year-old daughter. She shielded her child until it was all over. What do I do next, she asks. She says there's no power, heating or water to her home, which has been severely damaged in the blast. Russia's latest missile barrage killed 10 people and shut down all of Ukraine's nuclear power plants for the first time in 40 years, plunging the country into its worst nationwide power outages yet, as well as into freezing darkness. Authorities have been working to get the lights and heat back on, as well as to restart three nuclear plants in Ukrainian-held territory. As for the vast Aparizhia plant in Russian-held territory, it had to activate backup diesel power, but was reconnected on Thursday. Moscow has carried out similar attacks on energy targets about once a week since early October, but these are believed to be the most devastating so far. It's forced doctors to perform surgery in the middle of power outages. These surgeons completed an open-heart operation on a three-month-old baby during a blackout. They say the choice was either to do nothing and allow the baby to die, or try to operate. On Wednesday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky appealed to the UN Security Council to take action to stop Russian airstrikes. But Russia wields a veto on the council, so there's no prospect of action. Moscow acknowledges attacking basic infrastructure in what it calls a special military operation, saying its aim is to reduce Ukraine's ability to fight and push it to negotiate. Kyiv says the attacks are clearly intended to harm civilians, making it a war crime. A Kremlin spokesperson on Thursday denied launching any strikes on Kyiv targets, attributing damage in the capital to fallout from air defense systems. The European Union says it is pressing ahead with a ninth sanction package against Russia. European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen said that the regional bloc is working full speed to hit Russia hard with fresh sanctions in response to what she called Moscow's barbaric terrorist attack on Ukraine's major infrastructure. She also drew attention to how Ukrainians are forced to endure harsh living conditions following attacks that have led to water and electricity shortages. Russia denies deliberately targeting civilians in Ukraine but acknowledges a campaign of strike against electric power and other infrastructure, which Moscow suggests are aimed at reducing Kyiv's ability to fight and pushing it to negotiate. With opposition from international powers, the Russian government is also seeing the country's own citizens voicing their concerns against the mandatory military draftings. Russian President Vladimir Putin has promised to step up the amount of military equipment produced for the army as Moscow continues its invasion of Ukraine. He said there is no need to introduce any extraordinary measures, but it is necessary to establish clear, high-quality and well-coordinated work. Vladimir Putin insisted it was necessary to provide the armed forces with all the necessary equipment in a timely manner. But anger is growing among the relatives of Russian servicemen fighting in Ukraine. This mother has accused Putin of avoiding the Council of Mothers and Wives after they were not invited to a meeting between family members of conscripts and the president reportedly set to take place on Friday. 
The council wants transparency from the defense ministry over soldiers' whereabouts, as well as permission to speak openly about the problems of conscription. The Ministry of Defense has released videos like these in an attempt to quell anger by insisting that soldiers are treated well. Energy ministers of European Union member states failed to agree on the European Commission's proposal to cap the price of imported gas. The EU is currently battling record high energy prices, which are a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine conflict. A heated discussion and very divergent views. Just some of the words used to describe the energy ministers' meeting held in Brussels Thursday that ended without an agreement. The main sticking point is the 275 megawatts per hour gas price cap proposed by the European Commission. Some EU countries say the cap ceiling is so high that it would never have been activated in the past. Not even during the last month of August when prices in Europe were record-breaking. For the majority of member states, this is unacceptable. The mechanism has three serious problems, design, price and conditions. In other words, the three central elements are badly thought out. The way the three conditions are defined, it seems to be designed precisely so that it would never be applied. And this seems to us to be a bad joke on the part of the Commission. But there's a smaller group of countries led by Germany and the Netherlands that don't want any market intervention and who also worry about the impact on gas supplies in Europe. And the proposal that's on the table now regarding the market mechanism is flawed. Um, there is a lot of uh, risk uh, for uh, damaging the energy uh, security of supply um, and also for the stability of the financial market. So um, I'm also very critical on this proposal um, from a different point of view than some of my colleagues. The differences between member states is also affecting two other crucial pieces of legislation that was supposed to be adopted on Thursday common gas purchases and a solidarity mechanism among member states. Despite being informally agreed, some member states don't want to give the green light unless it comes with a new price cap on gas. China is expanding COVID lockdowns as infections there are on the rise. This move comes as protesters clashed with police over pandemic restrictions and pay disputes in one of Apple's biggest iPhone factories in the world. Some workers are angry about the conditions at the plant, claiming that they are being forced to share dorms with infected co-workers. Protests breaking out of Foxconn's flagship iPhone plant in Zhengzhou, China. The biggest iPhone factory in the world with 200,000 employees. <laughs> Dramatic video showing hundreds of workers clashing with police in hazmat suits, smashing surveillance cameras, throwing metal barriers and poles at police. Angry because of disputes over a delay in unpaid bonuses and strict quarantine COVID lockdown protocols following a sharp rise in cases in China. Daily cases hitting a record high today since the pandemic began. The plant has been in lockdown for four weeks, allowing factory workers to operate in a closed loop bubble where they live on site to stop the virus from spreading. Some complaining about the conditions, saying they have been forced to share dorms with colleagues who contracted COVID. Foxconn calling those claims untrue and releasing a statement apologizing for what it called an input error in the computer system, adding they're doing their best to actively solve the concerns. It's going to a short commercial break. More world news on the outside. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, the UN rights chief urged Iran to immediately halt violence against protesters as countries debated whether to launch an investigation into Tehran's deadly crackdown. For the past two months, videos like this one of Iranian security forces gunning down protesters have sent shockwaves across the globe. Fearful of what it calls a deteriorating human rights situation, Germany and Iceland requested Thursday's special council meeting. Their aim, debating whether or not to launch a high-level international investigation into Iran's treatment of its people. Since the protest movement began in September with the death of Masa Amini over her headscarf, security forces have killed, according to human rights activists, over 400 people, including some 60 children. They've arrested 17,000 protesters and jailed at least 3,000. On Tuesday, the council spokesperson said the rising number of deaths and attempts to cover them up are a sign of the critical situation. 
For its part, Iran's foreign minister said Europe and the U.S. have no lessons to give. With a long history of colonialism and violation of human rights of other nations, the U.S. and Europe are not in a position to pretend to be an advocate of human rights. Holding a fact-finding mission would come with massive challenges. For the regime has been lobbying hard against such an investigation. And the resolution itself isn't a done deal yet. Obtaining a majority vote by the 47-member council must first pass hurdles created by nations that are regularly against such investigations, like China. However, if passed, the resolution alone would give a morale boost to protesters and send the message that such violations will not remain unnoticed or uninvestigated. Following the regime's launch of an ICBM, the possibility of a nuclear test by North Korea, the U.S. has sent the world's largest nuclear-powered submarine to waters around Japan. The move is seen as a warning to North Korea not to conduct what would be its seventh nuclear test. On November 10th, the largest of the United States' Ohio-class nuclear power submarines, the USS Michigan, arrived in Okinawa, Japan. The over 170 meters submarine can operate for three months without surfacing and can carry more than 150 Tomahawk cruise missiles with a range of 2,500 kilometers. It's also capable of supporting special forces operations such as underwater infiltration. It might be considered odd that some of this information has been made public some two weeks after it stopped off in Japan. Submarines of this kind generally operate covertly, which makes it unusual that photos as well as the submarine's location were released by the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Military experts say that by publicizing the movements of the USS Michigan, the United States is actually sending a strong warning message to North Korea in response to the North's launch of a Hwasong-17 ICBM a week ago. It's also seen as a way to put pressure on the regime amid concerns that Kim Jong-un will greenlight a seventh nuclear test in the near future. It's speculated that the North could conduct a nuclear test later this month to coincide with the fifth anniversary of the successful launch of the Hwasong-15, believed to be theoretically capable of hitting targets anywhere on the U.S. mainland. With the anniversary slated for November 29th, South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff explained that it is monitoring North Korea's military trends ahead of the day, but there has been no notable activity so far. However, the big question remains, will the latest show of force by the U.S. scare off the North, or will it respond with further provocations? The head of Brazil's electoral court rejected a complaint from President Jair Bolsonaro's allies to challenge the result of the presidential election with the incumbent lost by a small margin, according to a court document. The court also fined the parties in Bolsonaro's coalition to the tune of $4.27 million for what it described as a bad faith litigation. Jair Bolsonaro receives yet another setback, this time from Brazil's superior electoral court, who refused his request to invalidate the results of the presidential election. The Liberal Party filed an appeal to the electoral court on Tuesday, claiming the malfunctioning of 280,000 electronic voting machines and stating that these errors cost their candidate his re-election. Incumbent President Bolsonaro lost to Lula da Silva in the election runoff by less than 2%, the narrowest margin in Brazil's history. The Liberal Party pressed for an audit, saying the voting machines were outdated and had an internal bug which affected the election outcome. The electoral court judge issued a stinging ruling rejecting Bolsonaro's demands due to lack of evidence and fining the party 4 million euros for acting in bad faith. It is a request that is offensive to the democratic rule of law and made in an inconsistent manner with the aim of encouraging criminal and anti-democratic movements. Jair Bolsonaro has yet to officially concede the election result along with his supporters who have been protesting across Brazil following Lula's victory. The outgoing president has authorized the government to begin preparing for the presidential transition. The former left-wing president Lula, who is returning to power, will be inaugurated on the 1st of January.
Malawi is in the grip of a cholera outbreak which has spread across the country, killing more than 290 people and infecting almost 1,000 people more, with cases being reported from all of its 29 states. Concerns arise as the disease is spreading rapidly during the dry season and the nation fears the condition to get much worse when the rainy season arrives. At a health centre in Malawi's commercial capital, Blantyre, a nurse is checking the IV drip on a patient. One victim of the country's worst cholera outbreak in more than a decade. For the patient's mother, Alida Piri, it is her second time in this ward. Malawi's healthcare system has identified a few health centres to focus on cholera treatment. Patients have been arriving in droves, and healthcare workers like Yunus Msalemu say they are struggling. When you are, when you want, to, you, you know what to do, but then you don't have this, you don't have enough equipment, and you don't have the, you don't have the supplies and the resources that you need to conduct your or to deliver your your work. Then that comes a challenge and a drawback for you to to to, to deliver. Complicating matters further is a lack of vaccines amid a global shortage. In October, the World Health Organization declared that they would follow a single-dose strategy. That's despite the fact that the cholera vaccine needs two doses to be most effective. Malawi still needs to roll out its second phase of cholera vaccines after taking a delivery of 2.9 million doses from the Global Alliance of Vaccines, Gavi, through the WHO. Many are scrambling for leftover doses from the first phase after the announcement of the vaccine shortage. According to Minister of Health Kumbize Chiponda, cholera has spread to all 29 of Malawi's districts. Most deaths have occurred in the four districts bordering Lake Malawi and in Blantyre. What's been particularly unusual is the waterborne disease's quick transmission during the dry season. Cholera usually spreads when rains are heavy and floods are prevalent. With the rainy season now arriving, the fear is that the outbreak is only going to get worse. Nurses across the United Kingdom will walk out of work for two days next month in unprecedented strike action for better pay, staff and paid and welfare. The industry action comes amid a staffing crunch in the NHS and the UK's cost of living crisis. Thousands of British nurses will go on strike in December, according to the union on Friday. An unprecedented move in the union's century-long history, coming on the cusp of what looks to be a tough winter for Britain's National Health Service. The nurses say it's the first of several possible walkouts in a dispute over pay and unsafe staffing levels as the UK sinks deeper into its cost-of-living crisis. Nurse Chukwudibem Ifejuna works for the NHS in southern England and says he'll be joining. I've had to cut down on a lot of things uh, with the kids, uh, which I can't afford to provide for them because of the high cost of living. So it's really, really tough for everyone, not just myself, my colleagues out there. You've got few nurses living as well to go and work in supermarkets because they will be paid better. Pay rises for nurses have failed to keep up with inflation, soaring at 10%. Downing Street says demands for extra spending on the NHS to raise staff pay to 5% above inflation were simply not affordable. Now the Royal College of Nursing, representing 300,000 nurses, has voted to strike, joining picket lines also growing in Britain's rail, postal and education sectors. The winter ahead also looks especially tough for the NHS. There's a record backlog of 7 million patients amid the global health crisis. Billy Palmer at the Nuffield Trust Health Think Tank says morale is low as patient care has been put at risk. You've got a lot of people leaving because of you know, being under too much pressure, for example, or those who are considering leaving, they often cite issues around not having enough staff to do a good job, for example. Despite being passionate about his job, his patients and his colleagues, Ifajuna says he has sometimes considered quitting too. But each time I've had the thoughts, I sort of had to pause for a minute and say, I can't leave my patients, I can't leave my colleagues to suffer alone. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. 
Chinese President Xi Jinping held talks with the Cuban president. She said that the two countries should march forward hand in hand on paths towards building socialism with their own respective characteristics and deepen bilateral relations fit for the new era. Malaysia's newly appointed Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim said that his primary focus would be on the cost of living as he takes office with a slowing economy and a country deeply split after a close election. Leftist Peruvian President Pedro Castillo has accepted the resignation of his Prime Minister and will reshuffle his cabinet once again amid a lengthy battle between the executive and the legislative branches. Honduran President declared a national security emergency and began implementing a new plan to combat a rising number of cases of exhaustion by violent criminal groups operating across the country. British Foreign Secretary unveiled millions of pounds in additional support to Ukraine during a visit to Kyiv as the country grapples with Russian airstrikes in a vital infrastructure with winter setting in. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with visuals of spectators lining the streets of Manhattan for the 96th annual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, a televised extravaganza of marching bands, floats and performances. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.